My name is uh, Clay Lacey. Uh, I'm from Van Nuys, California. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the DC airplanes. Uh, in about 1933, I believe it was, uh, the president, the chief executive officer of TWA, uh, wrote a letter to Donald Douglas in Santa Monica and uh, laid out the specifications for an airplane they would like to have. And the specifications were basically what this airplane can do as far as speed, number of passengers, range. And so Douglas uh, contacted, uh, uh, I believe it was Mr. Fry, and um, they signed a contract for the DC-1. And I've read, I think the price was like $90,000 to build the first one. And uh, they built it and uh, flew it. And it was a prototype for the DC-2. But TWA, uh, before they received the DC-2, they took the DC-1 and started uh, uh, using it to test it and to check the airway system and to check out their pilots in a more modern airplane. Uh, retractable landing gear they hadn't, had not had before. Uh, they were flying Ford Trimotors. And um, at any rate, uh, they ended up crashing the DC-1. Uh, I'm not sure, I don't remember what happened. But the DC-2 flew on, uh, made first flight, I think, on December 17, 1932, or 34, which is 32 years after the uh, Wright brothers first flight. And um, it was certified nine months later and uh, actually went into airline service in 1935. This particular airplane was uh, delivered uh, in March 1935, but not to TWA. It was delivered to Pan American. Now TWA, as I said, was the first customer that ordered the airplanes. But Pan American and many other airlines started ordering them. Uh, they were the most popular airplane at that time. This airplane saw service all over South America with Pan Am, uh, South American Division, uh, uh, Panagra. And then, uh, I'm not sure the different airlines it may have been with after that, but my first contact with this airplane was in about 1960. Uh, 60. Uh, this airplane belonged to Johnson Flying Service and was based at McCall, Idaho. They flew smoke jumpers in it. And then uh, the air, this particular airplane then became a, uh, uh, was owned by the Douglas Historical Society for many years, didn't fly. Then Douglas leased it from them and their uh, uh, retired, some of the retired people put it back in the air. And they owned it until um, uh, myself, uh, Bruce McCaw, and Joe Clark bought it about five years ago. Uh, and uh, I restored it uh, at Clay Lace Aviation in Van Nuys. It's in very good condition, new motors, everything. But it belongs to the museum at the Boeing Field in Seattle, the Museum of Flying. But going back to the airplane, what it did, they, they built approximately 200 of these. And, um, and in 1935, uh, well, in 34, I believe, uh, the story is, and I, I'm inclined to think this is correct, C.R. Smith, the CEO of American, who had ordered some DC-2s, went over to uh, Douglas and took Donald Douglas to lunch and said, why don't you push the sides out on this thing and get another row of seats in it, be an, an, another seven passengers. So if you notice, this airplane's flat on the sides, and the, all the threes around there are kind of curved. They're quite a bit wider, probably all, about two feet wider. They can have three rows of first-class seats and a wider aisle than, than uh, this airplane has. But anyway, they first flew the DC-3, I believe, on uh, uh, in December of uh, uh, 36, I believe. And uh, I could be wrong, it could have been in 35. So, okay, 35, uh, uh, December 35, I think. I believe that was also on the Wright Brothers Day, uh, December 17th. I'm not absolutely sure, but they tried to 
do that. And um, so the DC-3, of what's many more here, there's only one of these flying in the world, uh, all these DC-3s, uh, they came and exist. They were first flown uh, uh, in um, 35 and went into airline service, service in 36. And um, in June of 36, uh, United and I think American probably, they started uh, transcontinental airline flights from Newark to um, San Francisco and Los Angeles straight through. They'd leave 8 o'clock at night, Newark, and fly through the whole night, make four or five landings, and get to California at 8 in the morning. They uh, said, you leave at 8, get there at 8. And um, so they, it was a quantum leap, the two and the three, and what was available prior to that for airline service. And something that I always really amazes me is that the Wright brothers had to build their own engine. It only put out 12 horsepower. And 30 years later, they had dependable Pratt & Whitney and Wright engines that was very reliable that they felt they could safely fly at night and, and things, and I just think that was just tremendous uh, uh, progress, you know, in that 30 years. But, uh, so anyway, there were two types of engines. All the DC-2s had ride engines like this. Uh, these are 1,000 horsepower uh, each. When they first came out, they only had 775 horsepower. Then the DC-3 came out, and uh, they quickly worked up to 1,200 horsepower. And uh, I am not sure how many uh, right power DC-3s were made, but I think it was under 500. Certain airlines had them. Now, all the military C-47s all had Pratt & Whitney engines, 1,200 horsepower. And um, the, uh, uh, they advertised and they proved that the airlines did that the airplane could safely fly on one engine. And, um, they uh, just a quantum leap from anything they had before. Then they made a sleeper version when they started flying across the country at night. They made a sleeper version. I think eight people you could. Uh, they pull bunk things down off the wall and things they could sleep uh, across the country. Um, but anyway, these were in service, airline service through the 50s, uh, even on United. I started uh, as a pilot with United in 1952, flying DC-3s, and uh, they were still flying them in 1957, just before the jets came out, on certain runs, like up and down the San Joaquin Valley. But anyway, they advertised, it, it would go 180 miles an hour, three miles a minute, and it'll do that. We came out here, uh, we were averaging um, uh, uh, 180 miles an hour. We had a little tailwind, and we were doing over 200 a lot of the time, but the airplane itself, uh, it'll uh, true out 180 miles an hour, not knots, miles. And uh, was, uh, the people say, and I think it's true, that it was the airplane that put the airlines in business. Uh, the two to start with, but particularly the DC-3, when they could carry uh, a third more passengers. And um, it was, uh, you might see the first airplane they could make money with, that's what they say, and I'm sure it's true. And of course, um, there were about a thousand of them built for the airlines by the time the war came along. And then when the uh, military started buying them, you see all kind of figures, but they built, they built about 15,000. And when the war was over, you could buy them real cheap, surplus, so they never built anymore. Uh, Douglas didn't. You could buy them for fifteen to 20000 bucks brand new from the uh, military. And um, the, uh, a lot, lot of them went into corporate flying. Uh, the DC-3 made corporate flying because you could buy them, like I said, real cheap for $150,000. You could have a airplane almost brand new with a uh, interior, beautiful interior, uh, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, everybody, that's what they had. In 1955, before the jets came along, 
There was over 500 of these in uh, DC, uh, DC-3s in corporate service. And uh, so everybody says it made uh, the corporate flying in addition to the airlines.